So um, I'm just going to give you a little bit of a commercial view about this topic. Um, starting with a company that we think we've gone through a huge change in the last six or seven years. And we question how much change that the industry associations, which do play a really important role, have managed to go through and where do they sit relative to that. And I guess I'm going to be a bit of a critic, so I'll say that, uh, that up front, that things haven't moved on in the way that we'd like to see. It's a meat industry perspective, right, because that's where I've had all my career. But I guess people in other sectors of ag can sort out whether some of these messages apply to them. So before I joined Tees, which was about 11 years ago, uh, I did work in the industry. And uh, that behind me is the meat industry structure. Um, just how you'd like to set something up to get stuff done, right? So, uh, and there's a little body up there, AMIC, the Australian Meat Industry Council. And I spent 10 years in there. Um, it was called MATFA, it was called the National Meat Association, it was called AMIC. So it changed its name three times, right? But primarily did the same thing. Uh, you got used to working in that kind of organisation, taking just a long time to do anything. Now, and say, sure, I've been out of there 12 years now, and I, and I look back, and uh, I think, why would you do that to yourself? I know if I went to my boss with something like that now, um, he'd probably ask me, was I trying to avoid tax by setting something up, <laughs> you know, like that. So I guess that's the first question. But so I could stand up and just be really critical of it all, but why we're interested? And a little bit about us. So we, Brian said, we're a big part of the Australian beef industry. We process about 20 or 25 per cent of Australia's cattle. Up and down the eastern seaboard of Australia, there's six beef processing plants there. There's feedlots that uh, meet about a third of those needs. Um, Four and a half thousand people now, 5,000 people when we're at the other side of uh, a cattle downturn. Um, and I'm really proud to work in that business because in all those, you can't read the towns up there, but it's kind of Rockhampton, Billawheeler, Tamworth, Narracourt, Wagga. We're really important in those towns. We can come to this town and try and lobby, right? And we, we're one of 50 people walking into a minister's office each week and who cares, there's your 10 minutes. I tell you what, if one of our businesses isn't working in one of those towns, it's a big deal. Right? Those towns are in a lot of trouble. Um, and, and I guess Tees has been in business now 76 years, but we sat down about six and a half years ago when we put the business together with Cargill and, and we celebrated for about five minutes and we said to ourselves, if we keep doing what we're doing, we won't be here. Um, this commodity business, it's a dead end. And uh, we've presented on that before. And I guess the next slide I'm going to show you is something we're really proud of. And this will build out really quickly. We're really proud. I showed this internally a few days ago. And while we're happy with that is five years ago, none of that existed. The business has started to move from something that's selling commodity to something that's really focused on providing solutions for customers. And you see there, I want, we haven't got all day, we could talk about this because we really like to, but um, you can see some centre of the plate meal options which are sold in Woolworths. Down the bottom you've got some alternatives to the, the roast chicken that people pick up from the grocery store. Uh, and the business is heading more and more in that direction. Uh, and we're doing that to survive because, um, as, as I'll show you in, over the next two slides, we can't afford to be in that commodity business anymore. So the commercial business is moving forward. And you know, we're starting to work a lot with producers and, um, and bring them along for this journey, right? Because if we haven't got cattle producers working with us and uh, operators in the supply chain, we can't do this. Because we show up to work every day with lots of assets and no raw material. So a lot of expensive assets that are actually worthless without strong trust-built relationships. Um, and the good news in agriculture, because there's the same curves for most agriculture commodities, we're in the right spot. And there's lots of ways you can represent this, but you know, it's the old saying, by 2050, demand doubles for protein. Great. But we know 
that doesn't guarantee success for us. Um, we've got to be able to meet that demand in a cost-effective way around the world. But a good start, right? And why you see lots and lots of investment coming into the country for agriculture, really. You know, the investment markets know these things. Uh, however, there's obviously some challenges for us as a country, and this, you know, well publicised, and this is internally, this is what we call the dose of humility in our business. Because I can stand up and say, you know, we're a quarter of the beef industry, but that first chart there, there's a billion head of cattle walking around the earth at any given time. And there's about 28 million of them in Australia. So the, the first thing that says is, if you want to try and play in a commodity market, good luck in setting a price, right? You're going to take the price the world sets. The one next to it is a simple graph of manufacturing costs in the country, and I think that comes from AFGC. We're an expensive manufacturer. The car industry uh, lobbyists have been telling this city that for a long time. It costs about twice as much to process uh, cattle in Australia as it does in the US, and about three times dearer than in uh, Southern America. Right. And the bottom one is just as important. That's feed conversion ratios, and anyone in the feedlot business knows that one. It takes a lot more feed to produce a kilo of beef than it does pork and chicken. That tells me I'm an expensive manufacturer. And I better be doing a really good job in those high value markets around the world if I'm going to be here in the long term. And that's, we really focus on those three messages internally. Hence all those products you saw on the previous slide. So I guess why I talk about all that in a, uh, in, in a presentation about industry associations? Well, I guess here they come. And we think industry associations do have a very important role. Um, and I guess our simple message is that in our business, we think of inside and outside the tent, right? Inside the tent's all the stuff we can control, so our labour productivity, our imports, how well we uh, deploy our capital, how well we hire and recruit people into the business. We do that. That's our job. But there are things that we just can't control as a business. And I just highlighted two of them there, and government-induced costs and charges, for example, are a really big issue. As I said, we're really expensive. Um, you know, labour market, for example, um, you've got the award system, which seems to change with the whim of the prevailing government, right? I've been in IR a long time, and uh, you know, the rules change all the time, but somehow the relationship with employees doesn't. Uh, you've got you know, access to labour and imported labour, you know, still a critical issue in rural Australia where you've got, you know, shortages of labour in lots of towns. Utilities costs. Um, I wouldn't like our bill for utilities. It's going to be around $36 million this year, right? And they're the types of things that have lots of government imposed you know, and an effective industry association can get on top of those sorts of things and talk about it. Uh, market access, I heard this morning it was about a $3 billion in technical barriers to trade. I thought the number was about a billion, but it's a huge number. The point of that is that's a government to government thing. We require our government to negotiate with their counterparts to get a good outcome for our industry. We look for an effective industry organisation. Uh, but I guess the, this is where the, the critical part starts, and then I promise the next slide's where it really does start. Um, that's no different to a paper that was written for this conference 18 years ago. Uh, exactly the same issues if you go, and I'll put the reference down there. Um, it could have been exactly the same points pulled out. So how well have we done advocating our issues? And uh, I guess, and I've used car analogies wherever I talk, so that's an E.H. Holden for anyone that uh, likes old Australian cars, given there are no new ones anymore. Um, <laughs> And my, my father used to do them up, so that's, that's why I picked that one. But, and you think I might be a bit unfair calling our industry associations like that, but um, I really could be too nice because that little Chevy in the corner is 1928. And the Meat Industry Association, AMIC, has its origins in MATFA, because remember I worked there. And the constitution and its structure was founded in 1928. So my question is, 90 years or so on, um, maybe things have changed. Brian talked about it. We then go and do a whole bunch of work. We get consultants and committees for years, and we come up with a much better version of what we had. Um, now we were never allowed to have superchargers when we did things, but that, that's beside the point. And we pat ourselves on the back and say we fixed up our industry, but in reality, we get to the starting line, 
and here's the competition. And I picked those three organisations down the bottom, but you could put a whole bunch of others. They're the organisations that are competing for space with the community um, and with governments. And we've got to get a really effective lobby group behind us to be able to do that. And a really quick message, why? And, oh, and the Aston Martin is just because everyone wants one, I think. So. Um, and no, they don't pay people in uh, the meat industry well enough to ever, ever do that. But this is the important message. Um, and I think an effective industry association can deal with what you can see up there. Don't have time to go into it, but what that says is that since 2007, technology's taken off at a rapid rate. When the guy, when Steve Jobs pulled the iPhone out of his pocket, that was 2007, and people are getting left behind. And the point of that is an effective industry organisation can really help bridge that gap. And we really worry in our business that we're leaving farmers behind with technology. Um, but we're failing the first test in the meat industry as well. And I guess while that structure, that diagram I had, gives organisations legal rights to represent us, they don't. AMIC represent less than 50% of the beef industry. We've had Senate inquiries. We've had years of debate about does the Cattle Council represent anyone at all? And I put the ABA up there because they're always proposing the counterpoint. Um, that's a whole other debate, but I guess the problem with that is that it's not helping industries adapt to change. The chart on that's just telling you where everyone lives, right? And the problem, we all live on the eastern, well, most of us on the eastern seaboard. The problem is most of us are all the consumers in Australia, all the people that elect governments, inform popular opinion. How do we reconnect with the bush? And an effective organisations can do that. Second point's really dear to me, and I worry about industry associations. They love to fight in the media. But what message does that send to producers about trust that they can have in their own supply chains? And that's that trust that we rely on to run our business. So I get really angry when I see organisations trying to undermine that trust. And that's why we occasionally come out in the media and say things, because that trust is so hard to create. And Brian raises a good issue. Are we acting as a handbrake on innovation rather than a facilitator of it? And um, it would also be nice to get on with that stuff that was highlighted nearly 20 years ago. So I agree with Brian. What we need to do is something different. We need to move forward in a, in a consumer or a customer-led way, and we need to do it together as a supply chain. There's no good having an organisation representing cattle producers, lot feeders, processors, etc. We need to work together because we're serving a customer at the end of the day. And, and I agree with small and scalable to have political influence rather than try to do everything. Because I can tell you, I can get into a meeting with my counterparts of 40 people and there'll be 40 opinions of what's important and they'll all be different. And the reason we want to do that is because we're important. The beef industry is important to this country. Um, some of this data comes from AMPC, some from some research commissioned by AMPC. A lot of Australians rely on us. As I said, you don't notice until you go into a regional town, you see a meatworks that's shut. It's a pretty sad town. And um, you know, we're absolutely in our watch committed to making sure we don't do that. You know, lots of export earnings. How do we make you know, no one in, in, rural, in um, metropolitan Australia knows those types of facts. An effective organisation could do that. And we want to do it also so we can effectively compete against that Aston Martin you saw earlier. That's a pretty good looking hamburger, right? But it's not meat. Um, that's a plant-based burger. The picture was taken um, by quite a poor photographer, um, and me, um, in... Uh, in uh, last year in the US, and I, I've highlighted that Dominion movie. I probably shouldn't promote the thing, but uh, that's a movie that's coming out at the end of March, and it's going to be very, very critical of the animal production industry. Right? It's got a particular, obviously, bent. But the point of that there is certainly not to promote it. Don't go and see it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but is is to say that we need effective bodies to represent what our industry does well, because a movie like that can pull out half a dozen things or a dozen things over 10 years, but we've got a huge weight of evidence to say we do a very good job and we need to come together collectively to do that. So I guess we've got time for, we always use that slide, thank you MLA, I don't know how you actually do that with meat, but we've got time at the end for that, but um, where, where I want to finish is to say that 
I hope that this sort of gen starts to generate a bit of debate amongst the people that actually earn a living out of the industry because we can do it better and I guess we owe it to ourselves. So I'll end it there.